In this video, we're going to take a detailed look at experiments and how to properly conduct them. If you remember from the last video, an experiment is used to isolate and understand the effect of a single variable. Experiments are really useful because they allow researchers to establish a cause and effect relationship between two variables. So the first term you need to know about is the independent variable. This is the thing that the researcher will manipulate or change in an experiment. And ideally, this is the only thing that will change. They try and control for everything else. The dependent variable is the variable that the researcher is measuring. So let's use the same example from the last video to try and keep things simple. If we're researching the effect of coffee on sleep, then coffee is going to be that thing that we change. It's our independent variable. And sleep is what we're trying to measure, so that's our dependent variable. So let's say we did the experiment and we found some interesting results. Well, no one in the scientific community is really going to trust the results until they get repeated. And for that to happen, we need to explain exactly what we did in the experiment. That means we need to clearly define our independent variable and our dependent variable. And this process is called operationalization. So in our example, we're using coffee. Well, we need to say what kind of coffee it is. How much coffee did they drink? How much caffeine is in the coffee? And what time of day they had the coffee, like how long before bed? Once we've answered those questions, then we can say that we've operationalized our coffee term. Now we need to do the same thing for the dependent variable, which is sleep. If someone closes their eyes and stops moving, are they actually asleep? How do we really measure this variable? Well, to actually measure sleep, we can either bring the subject into a lab and hook them up to an EEG machine, or we can take the common shortcut and just ask people how much they slept. Okay, that's operationalization. It's a really commonly missed term, so if you remember that, you're gonna stand out. Cheers, mm, coffee. Okay, all right, let's keep going on key terms. The next thing you need to know is the difference between the experimental group and the control group. The experimental group is the group that gets treated with the independent variable. For us, this is the coffee drinking group. The control group, on the other hand, is the group that does not receive the treatment. It's just there for us to use as a comparison. So in our example, this group gets no coffee. Poor control group. Okay, now it's time to look at some things that can ruin research, and these are called confounding variables. A confounding variable is something that can affect the results of an experiment, but is not part of the independent or dependent variables. So let's imagine that I'm doing the coffee study, but I collect participants at a university, and I didn't realize that it's finals week. Oh, I'm so bad at research. Okay, my data is gonna be ruined because those students aren't gonna sleep during finals week anyways. The coffee's not gonna matter. In this case, finals week is a confounding variable that has messed up my study. Another sneaky effect that we have to watch out for is the placebo effect. This effect takes place when a person's beliefs about being treated actually cause a change in their condition. Sometimes the knowledge that you've taken medicine is enough to make you feel better before the medicine is even doing anything. It's all in your head. So to control this, we can give a group a fake treatment. If you see the same outcome in the experimental group and the placebo group, it means that the independent variable isn't actually doing anything. It's just the placebo effect. All right, but before you do any research, the first thing you gotta do is collect some subjects. So you need to know the difference between population and sample. Population refers to the entire group of individuals that the researcher is interested in studying. A sample is a smaller group of individuals selected from the population that's used to represent them in a study. So if you wanna learn about high school students, then you better sample at a high school. You want your sample to look a lot like your population. If you get that wrong, then you're gonna have something called sampling bias. So sampling bias happens when for some reason your sample is different on average than your population. And to prevent this, we randomly sample. Random sampling is a method of gathering participants that involves selecting people randomly from the population. So let's imagine I'm doing research on the physical fitness of high school students. Ideally, I would get a good mix of all the students at a given school, or better yet, the schools in a given area but I'm bad at research. So I decided to stand outside of the gym and get volunteers there. And now my sample is full of gym bros. Welcome to Psych Notes, how much you bench. <laughs> okay, um, and the gym bros are not representative of students at the school. I've created sampling bias by not randomly sampling. All right, moving on. Once you've got your sample, you need to randomly assign them to either the control group or the experimental group. 
This should help minimize the effects of confounding variables. Lastly, you need to know what a quasi-experiment is. A quasi-experiment is a research design that's similar to an experiment, but the people are assigned to groups based on their characteristics. For example, we might be interested in political differences between people who are from Nebraska versus Colorado. That difference in where they grew up is the independent variable, and we can't change that. So we just have to select our participants non-randomly, which makes this not a true experiment. It's a quasi-experiment. Okay, so that is a quick overview of experiments. In our next video, we're gonna take a look at other forms of bias in research.